Good evening, everybody. My name is Philip Gray, and I am the Vice Chair of the Engineers Ireland GB region. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to tonight's event on GDPR. Um, before we get started, um, obviously our, Chris, our host, our presenter tonight is, uh, will, will be kind of giving our presentation momentarily. Uh, but if I could ask you all to use the Q&A function on Zoom to ask any questions, and Christopher will be able to answer those at the end of the presentation. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to start my introductions. So I'd like to welcome Christopher Cabral uh, to uh, the Engineers Ireland GB region tonight. He's also a committee member, which is fantastic. Uh, he's a chartered engineer with Engineers Ireland and is also a solicitor with DS Solicitors. So um, without further ado, I'll hand you over to Christopher. Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening to all of you. <clears throat> I just want to correct something there uh, from uh, Philip. I'm not yet a fully qualified solicitor, but I do hope to become uh, fully qualified in the next couple of months. Yeah, so, okay, my name is uh, Christopher Cabral. I'm a, I'm a chartered engineer, as, uh, as was introduced. And uh, I currently work for uh, Dias Solicitors. Dias Solicitors, uh, we, one of the, one of our specialties is actually immigration law and uh, such as uh, work visas, sponsor licenses for employers, and uh, also family visas. Um, there's a great amount of uh, data that we take from clients that needs uh, protections, and hence the, um, uh, we, we try to keep up. We, well, actually, we do keep up with the uh, uh, data protection matters. So um, yeah, so uh, start, starting with my presentation, the um let me just uh, there you go so um like what what is gdpr uh, most likely if you are an engineer or running your own business you most likely have the idea or an idea of what is gdpr already and um most likely the what you are thinking what what you would be thinking is something like uh, in order to avoid penalties i'll just Keep your data, and I I won't uh, I won't do anything with it. So at least um, I I keep away myself from from any penalties. But the the thing is, it's not just that. Even if you hold data, even if you hold data and do nothing about it, and you didn't do anything to protect it, you still become uh, possibly liable. Okay, so that so it's a um, it's a in our daily work as an engineer. <clears throat> Always and always we have clients and uh, we would normally need client details. And sometimes we ask for uh, sensitive information. Uh, this could be uh, disabilities. This could be um, like a pro probably when uh, in a world of a civil engineer, you probably look for a client might ask you to, okay, I need a room in here to put all my wealth. Uh, so it's quite important that the, that information is kept safe. Another thing is for electrical engineers, maybe, or for ITs, you know, all those alarm systems, it needs to be keep, kept safe. Um, but I'll discuss most of this throughout, throughout the, uh, the slides. So in our daily existence of doing all of this work, it would appear that all of us needs to take care of the data that we take in. And also, uh, on the other hand, that any people that we deal with, that we, we give our data to, could also take care of the same data. Okay, so it 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 like um we do have rights, and all these rights, when infringed, uh, may be it, it could be it could result in something that's uh, something that you don't like because like breaching someone else's right comes with uh, penalties. But then it it could be it could be severe or it could be light. Nonetheless, it will still be penalties, which uh, I'm I'm sure nobody wants. Okay. Um, now, what are these individual rights? Now, these individual rights, they, they're, most of it are, um, in, in terms of data protection, all these individual rights leads to the best interest of the person himself, such as you and me, and also if the, to the best, inter uh, be, best interest of the public at large. So, it looks like it's common sense, but I'll, I'll go through it anyway in brief. So at least we just have a, a, a bit of a, uh, um, how do you say it? Something like a confirmation of what it is, if you like, okay? So we have the right to be informed. So it, for, us to ha uh, for, have, for us to exercise this right, we, we can ask the, the uh, person holding our data 
and on how he is holding it or how uh, who, who could access it and for how long could this data be accessed now the reason why you wanted to ask that information is uh, is uh, related to the uh, the other rights such as uh, the, uh, the like you wanted to you want to know whether your data is being used legally or lawfully and also to your best interest or whether it is to the best interest of the public so that is why that it, we come to the next right which is uh, the right to access your data now if you have given your data for to, to somebody say say for example uh, one of your cl clients gave you data and then they want uh, later on to access their data then you are obliged to uh, you have to give him that data so that he could check whether that data is still correct is it is it still uh, updated uh, whether it's it still could be used and whether it's being used for the correct purpose okay now if in case if in case it's wrong the data that was collected uh, that that's being held is wrong then you have the right to demand rectification so that data that they held that, that they uh, hold um, that's about you you need to tell them to have it uh, corrected uh, there's a like unupdated data could lead to detrimental effects let me give you an example so in the UK and also in Ireland, we have this, um, um, what do you call this? The um, When you apply for a loan, they check, you, you have a credit check, right? Credit check. Now, these companies are normally not based here in the UK or in Ireland, rather they're based somewhere else such as the United States. And, and more often than not, it's so difficult, if ever you can, ask them to change your data. Because sometimes they would hold data on you, which was like so old already or maybe there was a uh, it was a typo error which leads to the fact that uh, which leads to the result that your credit rating will be very low and as a result you can't apply for a loan what if that loan is for your mortgage or for something very special it has it may have a detrimental effect on you if uh, you cannot rectify the data that is why you have the right to rectify okay now moving on <clears throat> you also have the right to erasure Erasure is really the right to be forgotten. Everybody has the right to be forgotten, albeit in, um, in, in, in some circumstances, not in every circumstance that you have the right to, for, to be forgotten, especially so, say, for example, uh, hopefully not, you have committed a crime. Of course, your data will have to be, uh, will, will have to be uh, stored. Or, for example, you've got a debt, so your debtor could uh, um, keep your data. For, for the uh, for the uh, for those reasons as we go along the slide i'll explain to you <clears throat> when you could keep those data okay so um moving on let me just uh, drink a bit of uh, uh water okay <clears throat> so where are we the right to restrict processing the right to restrict processing is the right your right to tell someone or whoever's holding holding your data not to process your data i'll define what uh, what what is processing what does processing mean later on uh, towards the, um, the the next slides at least we could understand it more so not to process data or to limit the processing of data or they could so that they could just store it with your consent so <clears throat> the, the the first one that we mentioned uh, earlier on is the right to erasure now if you can't it's an alternative way to keep your data for the for you for the other people to keep your data is to restrict them from using your data or processing your data okay so um and then they could then uh, use your data until they receive further instructions from you all right and uh <clears throat> moving on uh, right to portability the right to port portability just um it, it's basically says that uh, you have the right to uh, receive your data when you request in a format that is readable generally readable let me give you an example a few years ago maybe four or five years ago uh, there was this, there were issues about uh, so social media so then as a result you need to request for your data what was uploaded what's it, what, what are you keeping so they they it, they actually gave the data but the format that it was given given was um, something that you can't read it's only for special people with you know, with the good um, <clears throat> good uh, IT skills and softwares who could read it. So it's unreadable. It's unreadable. So this right came into play, the right to portability, so that you could uh, you could um, ask whoever's holding your data to issue you 
um, the data that they hold in a readable format. Okay. I hope I'm still making sense. <laughs> All right. Now, the right to object, uh, that's the second to the last right. The right to object is uh, it is your right to tell someone to stop using your data. It could be it's it's similar to the right to restrict processing, uh, but it's a in, in there are circumstances where you don't like to uh, to you don't like to uh, rely on that right. Rather, you want to rely on the right to uh, uh, to object. Now, you could an example of this is uh, email marketing. When somebody sends you an email, keeps on sending you email, you could demand for them to stop um, to stop that. And if they don't, it's a breach of your right. Okay. And the last, uh, the last uh, right is the right against automated decision making. This right, this right is um, has something to do with uh, mostly online processing. You know the way when you apply for a job, say for example, or a loan, or some sort of something, you're making an application, and when you make that application, you fill up the form, you know, and then the result comes back, and it could be that uh, your result is not uh, in your favor. Now, if that result is something that is uh, detrimental to you, then you have the right to object to that automate, automatic decision that was made against you, for example, uh, without human interve intervention. So meaning you could appeal and you could ask them to, uh, like a, a real person to have a look at it. Okay, so that's, that's, uh, that's the right against automated uh, decision making. It normally happens in applications of loans, sometimes in employment applications, and some other things. Okay, uh, now the next, of course, those rights, every right that we have has to be found in some sort of a legislation, something that gives you the right. So what gives you this right? Um, I'm only talking about the GDPR rights, of course. They're not, there are some other rights, but let's just limit it to GDPR. Now, the uh, rights come from uh, <clears throat> what we call as a, the, the uh, applied GDPR the applied GDPR, okay? So in order to understand that, let me give you a brief history. So the, um, the, the first data, uh, the, the first uh, data protection, well, actually the second was initiated by the EU, which is called by uh, called the Data Protection Directive. <clears throat> now, due to the advance in technology, they had to uh, rectify or ratify this, uh, uh, this um, data protection directive so then they came up with this uh, um, um, uh, reg regulation that's called the, the GDPR, Gen General Data Protection uh, Regulations. That's still um, we did at EU level. But when we left the EU, when the UK left the EU, what happened was the, the Data Protection Act 2018 came into play. The 2018 Act incorporated the, the GDPR, meaning the, uh, the EU legislation into UK law and made some amendments to it so that we also have the applied GDPR. So the applied GDPR is a combination of the GDPR, which is the EU legislation, and some, uh, some other legislations and regulations uh, in, within the UK. Okay, I hope I'm still making sense. <laughs> okay, so um, an example, uh, the, the reason that uh, this has to be done is so that the UK could still trade with the EU. Because otherwise, without without that, they can't because of the EU GD, uh, because of the EU directive. So it's sample when someone from the UK buys something online from the uh, from from the EU, then uh, GDPR comes into play, like the UK GDPR. And uh, but what happens if you um, you bought something from the states? You live here or you live in Ireland, then you bought something from the states. Now the states have a the United States have a. Um, um, a similar one, something like this, their own GDPR called California Consumer Act. So it's practically the same thing. It does the same thing. They, they only call it differently. Okay. So um, so that's that. That's the that's the history. That's the history, and that's where the uh, rights comes from. And it also tells us um, uh, what happens if those rights are violated. Okay. So the. Um, so we now ask what would be the consequences if the, the, these rights are violated. So this, the, um, <clears throat> the, the, the penalties are governed by section 155 to 159 of the Data Protection Act of 2018. And it is enforced by the uh, Office of the um, uh, Information Commissioner's Office. That is called the ICO, short, uh, short uh, 
so the, the uh, acronym is ICO. Now there's a there's a very the, the ICO would deal with it in a case to case basis, but there's an upper limit of 17.5 17, 17 million or 4% of the annual worldwide turnover. That means that like this normally applies to a company. <clears throat> so when the company say it has branches all over the world, then those figures would apply. Now, of course, it would be in severe situations uh, that the, the, this, uh, this penalties would be reached. Uh, there's a standard limit, however, of 8.7 million or 2% of annual worldwide turnover. Those are the penalties, maximum penalties. Okay. Now, if, if it's not a penalty, say it's uh, there's an element of fraud or other criminal uh, criminal um, intents, um, why these uh, breaches ha have occurred, then of course you will exp you will be exposed uh, to criminal proceedings or to civil um, civil litigations. Um, again, going into uh, the situation of getting penalized. Okay, so the recent prosecution that was done by the ICO is uh, the case of uh, Christopher O'Brien. Now, I don't know whether Christopher O'Brien is Irish or not. I, I don't think he owns the O'Brien sandwiches, is he? <laughs> no, he doesn't. It's someone else, okay? So uh, oh, Mr. O'Brien is, uh, is a worker. He's an employee of the NHS. And then he took some uh, information, uh, like data of the uh, service users of the patients of Sark, uh, South uh, Warwickshire of the NHS Foundation Trust. He made use of this. He made use of this information improperly, and as a result, he was uh, he was prosecuted. It's lucky that he's only he was only prosecuted and uh, ended up with a three thousand pound fine. But you can see from here that um, you know every everyone is um, uh, vulnerable to to, to the, not not just companies. It could also be employees. So you can see that you, you have to do your share as an engineer when you're doing all of the when you're working as an engineer or dealing with other people's data because you if you, you don't want to be fined <laughs> you, you, you don't you, you know you don't you don't want to be in a situation when you have to attend court defend yourself that's really really very stressful okay so how do we what do we do what do we do then in order for us to um, to um, avoid try and avoid if not point us to the right direction the uh, the what, what what sort of actions do we do? Now I came up uh, I I came up with this uh, presentation. Uh, this present uh, this uh, no this presentation is actually like um, could be found in the website of the ICO. It's not exactly this like this, but all information that I'm giving here is most like most likely you will find it with the uh, with the ICO website. Okay, so knowing uh, <clears throat> so. The GDPR, the, leg the legislations concerning GDPR is really like, it's, it's so big, this, it's a wide array. So uh, what we have in here that I'm presenting to you are the principles so that at least you've got an idea on either where to go when you're faced with a situation, or um, if you just follow it, at least minimize the risk of getting penalties, okay? Um, so let's go to the basic definition. So at least we could then relate these definitions to the uh, principles that will follow. So personal data. <clears throat> what do you think of personal data? So personal data as defined by the act is any information relating to an identified or identifiable living person. It doesn't apply to persons who are already deceased, okay? But take note though, um, there are other rules governing data that are uh, for the deceased, but the GDPR doesn't come into play when the person's already deceased. All right. <clears throat> so um, it, personal data also applies to, a, uh, to um, a collection of data that will lead to the identification of a person. Say for example, you've got, um, you've got a, um, the date of birth and then you've got the description and um, you happen to find the um, you happen to find the um, uh, Facebook account of that person, and it seems to fit the description. You made use of this data, leading you to identifying who the person is and getting more data for that person. <clears throat> so that's the um, that's that could be defined as personal data. Now there are specially uh, special category data, special special uh, category data. These are 
data that when exposed will cause a catastrophe to the uh, or a real a real danger or harm to the person who owns it or the public at large okay, th those are the those are the types of data the, uh, an example is say so you went to counseling you went to counseling you you, you told your counselor uh, x amount of uh, information and this counts uh, and this counselor placed it on his comp on her his or her computer but then left it off guard he left he, he didn't do any course of action that will um, secure that data or protect that data someone else took it and exposed it to the public it could be that it could cause a say if it's a politician what happens then is he will be he, will, he probably will lose the career it could be it could be a variety of uh, things but this special category data is something that will cause uh, severe harm to, um, to to the owner or to the public at large okay so that's special now let's define processing now we talked about personal data if personal data is not processed then it's not covered by gdpr so what do you mean by processing processing is the action the course of action of what you do onto the data it could be that say i told you uh, my name is uh, Christopher. I live in this place, and this this is my date of birth, telephone number, so and so. I just gave it to you, but you didn't do anything. You just listened to it. That's not processing. But the minute you start writing it, that's already processing. The minute you start saving it into a computer or something, that's categorized as processing. So it's processing is defined as whatever you do to that data, something you do to that data. You save it, you store it, you give it to someone else. That's called processing of data. Okay. So. And then um, we also have people involved. The people involved um, in, in the entire process is you've got the data controllers. Data controllers, these are the people who decide on what kind of data should be, um, should be collected. Say, say, for example, you've got uh, um, somebody's applying to be a nurse or an engineer, for example. Uh, the data that you need, of course, would be something like um, somebody, the manager needs to decide the hiring manager needs to decide whether what kind of engineer you're looking for. So you'll be looking for his um, academic um, academic certificates, um, um, experiences. Of course, the main things are the, the date of births and so on. Now, this the data controller. This is the person who will make the decision of what data is to be collected. And uh, of course, uh, they have the highest liability because they decide to collect it. They decide what they're going to do with the data and pass it on to what we call the data processor. Okay. Now, data processor, these are the people who will do something with the data. Say, for example, say, say for example, uh, I'm running an engineering firm. <clears throat> I speak to a client. I take the details from the client. These are data, personal data. And I will pass it on to my engineer, for example, who will work on the data. So the engineer who will work on the data that I have given is called the data processor. Okay. So whoever, so I take the the controller takes the data, passes it onto the uh, processor, and the processor will do what is necessary to to, to use uh, put put that data into action if you like. All right. So I'd like uh, the, the best example. One of the best example for that is say somebody say you wanted a say the client wanted a stamp done, uh, like a, to write the name say um say philip and then chartered engineer so that you could use that as a, to stamp your um, to stamp your um, documents so then some the uh, the receptionist will will collect that for example the receptionist the receptionist or the data controller will collect that and then pass it on to someone who will then engrave your name onto the uh, onto the stamp and put all your data on that, that you've given on it so that you could use it so that's that's the data processor so they're the one receiving uh, instructions. They, there, it could be that there's a sub-processor. Um, the liability lies, of course, from the highest, which is the data controller, then the processor, and the sub-processor. All of them are liable uh, in, here, in hierarchy. So you've got the highest liability and so on. All right. Uh, now, the next thing is uh, definition data subjects. Every single li uh, living individual is a data subject um, to be covered by GDPR. Um, it will be people living within the United Kingdom or the EU. Okay, and uh, of course uh, they they call it uh, something else in other countries, but data subject is us, just like the king subject or the queen subject. Um, <clears throat> and lastly, the Information Commissioner's Office. Uh, the Information Commissioner's Office was created by the uh, by the 2018 Act. 
Now, they are responsible for enforcing the uh, GDPR uh, laws. They, uh, they handle uh, complaints, they initiate investigations, they issue fines, and they um, initiate prosecution for those ones who are in breach. All right. So, um, so you can see all of this, most of this that I'm saying to you, they, they, they're actually uh, a piece of common sense, isn't it? It's, it's, you know it already. We're just basically confirming it. Um, okay, so the, the next, uh, the next uh, I, I now move on to the seven principles. So in order for us to know whether, uh, whether we're breaching, breaching, the, uh, breaching uh, the rights that I've discussed earlier on, is first, of course, we need to determine uh, what, whether it's data based on the definition that we've done, whether it's been processed, and whether it, it, it falls within the seven principles. If it doesn't fall, I mean, if we follow uh, the seven principles uh, along with the um, uh, relative to the uh, definitions that we, we, we looked at and the rights that we've uh, previously discussed, most likely you are uh, following the uh, GDPR, the rules of the GDPR, and you're protecting, your, protecting yourself. Right. Okay. So the the um, the first rule they're all interrelated they're all interrelated okay so like some of them are actually um, self-explanatory but I'll go through it nonetheless. So the um, the the first one is the, the lawfulness principle, the fairness and the transparency. So what do we mean by lawfulness? I think this is one of the uh, uh, one of the some of the confusion comes in because of, like how do you know if it's lawful or not? So the um, the Prima, the primary definition of it or guidance to it is like there has to be a valid reason why you are collecting the data. It has to be a valid reason. Now, it could be that um, you, you, while collecting the data, you also need to follow other laws. It could be something like uh, the copyright law or the uh, human rights law because you might be copying some data It's actually or taking downloading some data that's protected by copyright. So when you're doing that, of course, it's already unlawful to do it. So they're interrelated. They're interrelated. <clears throat> but uh, in saying that, there are six uh, basic uh, principles to follow when uh, determining whether the uh, whether determining whether collection of data is lawful or not. The first one is consent, which is uh, it's a bit of a contro controversy in terms of consent because sometimes you could imply that oh yeah I know he's, he seems to be consenting. But what it says, what it says is, we need to find out whether the consent was uh, um, given validly. We say valid. Did I, did I say, say, for example, I ask you, um, can you give me your uh, telephone number? Um, can I, can you give me your address? Can you give me your date of birth? And you say, and I said, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you. So you're giving consent. But what if I pointed a gun at you and I ask you to give those data to me? Of course, it's not a valid consent. So there are rules surrounding consent. Um, you just need to, um, sometimes your common sense will come into play, but you need to hear it that they're consenting to it and they're not being forced to give you the consent for it to be valid. That's the shortcut uh, um, analysis, if you like, so to know whether it's uh, the consent is be, being given uh, lawfully. Okay, so um, of course, when you steal someone else's data, there's no consent on that one. Also, another thing to look at is whether it's been withdrawn before you could use it. I may have given you uh, those information, but then I decided to take it back. Remember the rights that we we, uh, we 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 went through. So you now apply those rights. I'm not giving your consent anymore. So I'm taking my data back. I want it erased, or I want you to stop. So the consent is withdrawn. Okay. So the other basis is on the basis of contract. A uh, lawful basis of uh, collecting uh, information is on the basis of contract. Of course, when someone else, when when a person, when two people or two parties. Uh, decide to enter into a contract, you need details to be placed onto the contract. So, of course, it, it follows then that uh, taking that for the purpose of the contract is, uh, is lawful. Um, okay. So, the next thing is uh, if it is a, uh, a legal obligation. If, it's, if you have a legal obligation to provide your details to most likely a, uh, like your counsel, for example, or a, an authority, that legal obligation must be stated in, in uh, one of the legislations that's re relevant. So uh, in our work, for example, uh, apply, uh, immigration law, those information that we, we collect, 
that we has to be collected because there's legislation to say that those information needs to be collected and submitted to uh, the home office okay so that's legal ob obligation now the next thing is the uh, the fourth one is called the um, vital interest <clears throat> so vital interest uh, revolves around the uh, uh, principle that you need to collect this data in order to keep a person alive Okay, so that's that that's the that's the principle behind. So I need your data in order to keep this person alive. There's there are a few scenarios to it. It's a, but it's 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 a matter of reasoning whether yeah you really need that data, otherwise he'll die. But then someone else could also say, um, see there's an element of consent. You need to you need to um consent to give me that data so I could keep him alive. But then that consent is actually not given validly because it's there. But then you could rely on the uh, on 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 uh, the situation that it's it's a vital interest but has to be within legal uh, grounds okay right um the next thing is public task so uh, they it, the public the or the state or the uh, the council they need to perform tasks and when they perform tasks of course they need to get your data they need to keep your data and they need to process it but of course, when they do this, they still need to, your data to be protected. That's where the uh, uh, the public task um, uh, legal basis is used. Okay. Now the uh, the the sixth is the the, the sixth and the last uh, lawful basis is legitimate interest. The legitimate interest is actually a catch-all phrase. But in order for you to set, to rely on the legit, legitimate interest. Um, uh, principle uh, there has to be uh, you need to there has to be an assessment to be done it's um it's called a legitimate interest assessment now the the legitimate uh, interest assessment is comprised of uh, what we call a purpose test a necessity test and a balancing test now if all of those uh, tests are satisfied then you can rely on the legitimate interest um, it's a bit of a long topic to discuss, and it's uh, unfortunately we can't go through that now. As I've said, um, um, uh, a lot of this information would be available online uh, through the ICO website if you are so interested to go into this legitimate interest. Not everyone is in that position, but there's always someone who needs uh, information about this. Okay. Now, so let me move on then um, to to what we call fairness. So, are you using the data? that you have collected for the intended purpose? If yes, then it is fair. And uh, is there a reasonable expectation from whoever gave it to you that this data is being used for that purpose? And if the answer is yes, then yes, you are being fair. And um, say um, I, an example of unfair is that when you gave your email address to someone because yes, you, you were promised that you will receive a um some information let's say calculations for example so they, they they gave you the email the client gave you the email address so that you could send the, the calculations uh, uh, to them but then what you do if you you made use of that email address you took that opportunity to send them marketing uh, marketing um, uh, collaterals so you are now use you are not being fair because that's not the purpose why it was given to you or you could if you give it to someone else someone else made use of it then it follows. Now, transparency, the principle of transparency, this is being clear to your clients why you are collecting those data. And um, you also need to be clear on how to make their data safe. When I, when I, let me give you an example. Um, so we receive emails from clients giving their instructions, giving, sometimes they give them, uh, let's say, let's take the uh, situation wherein, um, say, a client wanted a a special design in his house because uh, of an ailment that he's suffering from. He sends that through email. He sends that through email. And you, as an engineer, just made use of a, um, let's say you were making use of your, um, of your uh, computer to look up uh, some illegal websites. And unfortunately, you received a virus or something that scans. Now, you became irresponsible on that side. So that in effect, in effect, when that data has been taken taken away from you as a result of your doing this illegal stuff on your computer, then you become liable for it, and you are not uh, you are not you did you you basically didn't uh, explain. Uh, supposing you explain to your client that you're not that you're keeping it safe, but you actually didn't, 
then you weren't being transparent to it because you did something else. Okay, so you need to be transparent how you stored it, how you're going to make it uh, safe, how you're going to access it, and who else we're going to access it. I know it's a lot. I know it's a lot to, to tell the client at one instance, but what you could do in order for you to, um, in your own businesses or in your work, uh, most likely if you have a business, you have a policy. Um, what I call this policy, it's a uh, privacy policy. So when on your privacy policy, you have either a short version of it or a long version to it, you, you send to your client, and then the, all of this fairness, transparency are being explained to them. So then you, what you've done is you've, um, you've adhered to the seven principles because you have explained it and you are actually following it. It's not enough for you to explain it, then not follow it. It becomes useless. Okay. So, so the uh, that's that. And the next thing is um, purpose limitation. I've mentioned this already, but I'll say it again. So the purpose limitation is. Um, when you were transparent, you, you told them how your data is going to be used. What is it for? So it has you, you need to explain to them that this data that I'm collecting will only be used for X, like uh, what's the intended purpose. And you don't go beyond that. Because if you use it, um, you use it for another purpose and there's no justification to it, then you become liable for that, uh, for that uh, action. Yeah, it will be a breach. Data minimis, minimization, uh, data minimization. So as the word stands, you need to collect data that is adequate for the purpose and not, uh, but uh, not in excess of what, um, uh, what, what you need it for. So for example, I need them, um, I just need to, uh, put, you just need uh, an email address. For example, you, you get the name, you get the email address, but then you saw that uh, she's got a beautiful daughter, for example, and then you ask, what's the name and details of your daughter? That's, that's a different uh, story altogether because you're getting excessive data in excess of what you actually need. All right, um, that's uh, the principle of data minimization. Accuracy, um, we've, uh, on the rights, when we were going through the rights, we mentioned about accuracy of data. Now, when data is not accurate, you have a gain or loss. That's We explained that earlier on. So you need to make sure that the data that you are collecting is, is accurate. And you need to do some steps to update those data as necessary. You cannot just sit down. Uh, so you collected data seven years ago. You're still processing the data, but you never made anything to update the data or to, to ask the person whether you're, you're still happy with the data. So... <clears throat> Every situation will be different. So it could be that uh, it's not to the interest of the client or the person to, um, to update the data. Then in that scenario, uh, you don't have to. But if it's in his best interest to update his data, then you need to ask uh, for uh, updated data. Okay. Um, now, next, uh, the next principle is integrity and confidentiality. <clears throat> so... Um, when we, when we process data, remember we defined what processing of data is. When we process data, we need to be very careful. We have to uh, put the necessary precautions so that that data is not leaked. So for example, you're typing an email, you're typing, replying to an email, but then you, the, when you type an email, you had this habit of putting the address first before you start typing. And then, you know, on the, in most of the email platforms, when you type the first letter, the the, uh, the the name comes up already. But without you knowing, because you were rushing, you sent the you sent the information um, wrongly to the um, to the to the um, wrong recipient, and then you didn't do anything about it. So it, 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 it that would be um, that would be a uh, um, a breach. But what you could do is put put together like a uh, a procedure on how you send emails, such as do not put the um, put put the addresses last. Type it first, put the addresses last, and then the, and, and then that will solve that uh, scenario. But as I said, there's so many scenarios of it. The question is whether you've done something to prevent that mistake from happening. Okay. Now, Alex. Uh, so the as a mit mitigating circumstance, the ICO, IC, the ICO will look for something that you have done to show that you have actually tried to protect that data the best you can. It just didn't work. But it's a mitigating. Uh, factor to have done that. If you have done nothing, then <laughs> just pray that you have a deep pocket. <laughs> okay. Now, um, where are we? Confidentiality, that's uh, it's, again, um, when we are working, when we are working, 
especially with sensitive data. Sometimes we forget that there are people there are people who are walking at the back and they could see the screen or you go to the toilet, for example, you leave your screen and then they could get data. They could get data. And uh, if it so happened that that's sensitive data, then it's it's going to cause you a problem and the company that we're working for a problem. So um, confidentiality, you have to have um, uh, like some, again, some sort of a procedure to protect uh, those uh, say passwords, login, computer screens, and all that. Okay, so that's uh, integrity and confidentiality. And lastly, um, accountability. Lastly, accountability. In account under accountability, um, I've mentioned this, this earlier. You have to demonstrate compliance with all principles. I have done this to comply with principle of lawfulness, purpose, data accuracy, storage limitation, integrity. That that's uh, and then you come into the accountability. You have to demonstrate that by way of your the the, the uh, privacy notices and all of those things that we've uh, already discussed. And um, so that um, um, there's this thing called um, the ICO has a um, a procedure that a prescribed procedure. It's not prescribed, but it's a recommended procedure. It's a recommended procedure. It's called the data protection by design and default. And they've got nine steps. Um, it's quite long to discuss again, so, but it's it's available on the ICO website. Following all of this, uh, following all of these procedures, when um, when you look at it in one go, it seems to be very difficult. But you'll benefit from from it, especially when you are running your own business. And uh, not everybody within that you let's say you've got employees, you need to brief them. You need to tell them what to do. Otherwise, both of you will be um, uh, responsible for it. Okay, so the um, there's also what we call a privacy by design and default. Again, that's a that's a um, recommendation by the ICO, and steps are available in their website. Okay, as 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 you can see, uh, the um, I'm now gonna come to uh, uh, what happens. What do you do when there is a breach? Now, a breach could happen in so many ways. Most of the breaches are actually. Uh, get nowadays we're using computers most of the breaches are through hacking somebody hacking into your systems believe it or not small companies are being hacked just for the sole uh, purpose of uh, the gdpr and then they if it like uh, most likely it's going to be in the wrong hands and they go through lawsuits and all that even if you you're just a small company they'll they, the hackers will will come after you because they get something out of it okay so in general, there's a duty to report certain uh, personal data breaches. Normally, it's 72 hours. Now, who do you report it to? You report it to the ICO. Okay. The ICO, this, they, they've got a, um, uh, they've got a um, um, member. Normally, when you put up a company, they'll send you a letter. They'll send you a letter and they'll invite you to be uh, to register so that uh, it could be a paid registration or it could be a free one depending on your circumstance. It's advisable to do that so that um, you and the IC could work together in running your business. Okay, so um, as mentioned there earlier, it's a, a breach would likely result to um, affecting individuals' rights and freedoms, and then uh, it comes with penalties. Okay, so I'm now nearing to the uh, end of my presentation. As you can see, we, we tried to compress it as much as possible, but please don't forget that there's a lot more to learn. These are just the basics in order for us to avoid uh, in order for us to avoid uh, um, penalties. There are over 100 frequently asked questions that's, that are avail available in the ICO website. Uh, these are categorized depending on uh, what uh, um, the information you're looking for. They're, they're categorized and it's, it's available on their website. Um, the, the, so in conclusion we're now into the conclusion so we've learned about the basic terms we've learned about the individual rights we've learned about the basic principles and mainly the lawful basis of collecting and holding personal data so knowing all this and adhering to uh, to these seven principles law and the, the, the lawfulness and knowing what the rights are um, I hope that it would um, somehow confirm what you already know and strengthen um, strengthen your knowledge about GDPR and avoid uh, prosecution or penalty uh, penalty notices. Okay, so that's it. Uh, we can now take some questions. There may be there may be some questions that I'm not able to answer, but um, it, it's a, in in general, to answer questions about GDPR, 
you go to your rights is 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 what you are uh, if what you are asking is within the rights then go to the definition if it's within the definition then go to the principles if all of these are in there then it's within gdpr and it could be answered some uh, uh, some uh, situations could be a lot more, a lot more um, difficult that will need um, an in-depth analysis uh, those ones i'm afraid i can't answer it here because that will require a lot of time to answer and it will need uh, relevance to other areas of law okay so thank you for listening um i think we have, we could now uh, take the questions <clears throat>